So let's uh, start with our first colloquium. We have Professor Oshani Senivratna from Rensselaer Polytechnic of Institute. Um, before uh, joining Rensselaer, she was in Oracle uh, doing some research on, uh, let me see, forgot. <laughs> Provenance. Yes, I, uh, I, I yes. did like your. Specializing in distributed systems, provenance, and healthcare related research. Uh, before that, uh, she was a PhD student at MIT uh, under uh, Sir Tim Berners Lee, who was the inventor of uh, uh, internet. Uh, he was a Turing Award winner, right, very yeah. recently. Uh, and the fun fact is that she's the only uh, PhD student he had. So she has very big shoes to fill, uh, fill and she's uh, doing an excellent join, uh, job at uh, Rensselaer. Uh, at Rensselaer, she's the Director of Health Data Research at the Institute of Data Expression and Applications. It's called IDEA, right? Yeah. And Rensselaer, uh, she leads the Smart Contracts Augmentation with Analytics Learning and Semantics Project. So the idea of this project is to predict or fix initially unforeseen situations in smart contracts. Uh, in blockchain-based systems. So I think that it would sound better if she explained what the research is. So today's talk is uh, smart contracts augmented with e-learning and uh, semantics. So I invite Dr. Sunny Ratner to tell more about her research. OK. I'm excited to have you. Yeah. Oh. This fell. <laughs> Uh, so first of all, thank you, uh, Isuru, for uh, yeah. inviting me to DePaul uh, to give this talk. Hey, before you start, is that chair in your way? Just it is. Your <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you. Good. And it's okay if I hold it, right? Like it might fall down. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, thanks, uh, Professor Godege, for inviting me. Uh, and so today I'll be talking about smart contracts augmented with learning and semantics. It's a project that I do at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Uh, with my lovely team. Uh, so this is joint collaboration with two other faculty at RPI and an industry collaborator from IBM. Uh, this is my PhD student and we've had uh, numerous undergraduate researchers over the year uh, working on this project. So today I thought, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with blockchain and smart contracts. Uh, maybe with a show of hands, I can know how many of you have heard about blockchain. I've heard of it. I've, how many of you have, uh, you know, used the blockchain, like you know, maybe own some cryptocurrency, traded? <laughs> Good. How many of you have heard of smart contracts? How many of you have programmed a smart contract? Cool. So, you know, the first 10 minutes may be a little bit boring for you, but uh, I hope you'll bear with me <laughs> on that. So I thought uh, of first giving an overview of uh, blockchain technologies. Uh, and then I'll talk about uh, my research on augmenting smart contracts. And then finally, we can have a discussion, but uh, you guys can ask me questions anytime. Just uh, feel free to stop me and ask me a question. Uh, and uh, those who are joining remotely or online, uh, it's sort of like, you know, if they you know, send you a question, like, I'm happy to answer those things. So first, I'll begin with why I'm doing this research. So. Uh, Professor Godege mentioned that I work with uh, the invent of the World Wide Web, Tim Berners-Lee. So if you look at the history of the internet, so internet was first uh, created in 1950s, 60s. And then there were these applications like DNS, the domain name system, email that we use daily, right? Um, and then the web came along in 1989, right? So uh, the web is an, is an application on top of the uh, internet, uh, you know, layers, numerous layers. Uh, ISO has seven layers. Maybe you have, you know, learned that uh, in a networking class. Uh, so since the invention of the World Wide Web in 1989, uh, there have been multiple developments on uh, various application-specific uh, uh, protocols, right? So HTML, uh, CSS, uh, you know, various technologies. Uh, and then, uh, you know, of all these, uh, you know, companies like Google's, Facebook's of the world who created, you know, billion dollar companies from um, uh, the invention of the World Wide Web. Like that, you know, growth cycle, uh, we are seeing something similar in the blockchain and uh, smart contract space. So blockchain uh, first became very popular in the 2008, 2009 uh, time frame, and now, um, just like the you know growth of the World Wide Web, 
we are seeing 20 if not 50 year you know growth curve uh, in relation to you know blockchain technologies and i think we are just you know scratching at the surface of uh, what's available and what kind of technical problems we might uh, foresee in the future with uh, these blockchain technologies so that's my primary motivation in delving into this research so i promised you that i'll you know give an uh, overview of blockchain technologies so let me first start with uh, the building blocks of uh, blockchain based systems uh, so the first thing is a record right like you know we need to have records of certain things and then you know uh, blocks contain multiple of those records and then the chain that has all the blocks linked together right so th these are the building blocks uh, but in order to first understand how the blockchain really works you have to think of transactions so let's say you know we have a transaction where Mr. Pink and Mr. Green, they engage in some kind of transaction. Uh, Mr. Pink has something that Mr. Green wants. So uh, uh, Mr. Green gives some money to Mr. Pink to buy that thing. Uh, and then this particular transaction is signed by uh, their public key. So how many of you are familiar with the public private key infrastructure? So you know, you can have a public key, which is public, uh, that anybody can verify. Uh, like if you sign something with your public signature, anybody can verify because you know uh, they know your public signature. If you want to encrypt something, you use your private key, and then you send it, and uh, uh, you know that's supposed to be a secret thing, right? Uh, actually, no. <laughs> you uh, encrypt it if you want to send it to somebody else. You encrypt it with their public key. You send it to that person, and then they decrypt it with their uh, private key, because they only know their private key. So anyway, so with the transaction, uh, we put that into a record. We assign it with our public key, so that people can verify that it is I who, who is authorizing this particular transaction. So that's that bundling of that transaction. And another thing that's uh, required in the blockchain ecosystem is uh, distributed consensus. Um, so the web, although it was designed to be uh, decentralized because of uh, some limitations in the domain name system, because of some of the design uh, decisions, it became kind of centralized. But blockchain technologies are inherently decentralized, meaning there's no central authority saying what needs to happen. And consensus happens uh, collectively. Right, so whoever wrote the, let's say, the Bitcoin protocol, they gave some rules. This is how uh, a transaction should be committed to the ledger, and that's uh, actually verified by multiple of these uh, uh, nodes in the network. So, once a record is verified by, uh, let's say, some threshold of uh, uh, nodes, then that record is committed to the chain. But that's not enough. Uh, uh, you know, the block creation also has some logic to it. So, uh, a block contains multiple of those records, and uh, a block has something called a hash, right? So you guys know about hash functions, right? Uh, so it's a one-way function. You input some uh, arbitrary long uh, string or whatever, and out comes a fixed-length uh, string uh, that we call a hash. And this hash is supposed to be unique, right? And the block has uh, uh, a hash, like this particular block uh, has the hash of the previous block, and then it com computes the, the hash of this particular block. Um, so then that's how the linking happens, which I'll show in the next you know, slide. So yeah, the hashes, like here, like you know, it says the hashes has to match, but uh, what really happens is, you know, they are linked because the previous block's hash is actually computed. Uh, in cre in, it's used in the computation of the next block's hash. So far, so good. Um, now, when um, you know when the transaction is committed to the chain, it's difficult to change. Now, let's imagine in the previous scenario, Mr. Green wants to change. You know, instead of saying that I gave, you know. $100 to Mr. Pink, he wants to come back and change to say that he, he only gave $10, right? So it's difficult to change uh, 
uh, transaction value like that because once they change uh, a record item, the hash changes. Uh, so that means they have to create a new hash and uh, that hash feeds into the next block, right? So uh, the whole thing breaks apart because uh, uh, like everything, you know, does not uh, match up, right? Now, technically, you can do that. Like you can actually uh, change a value and then create a new hash and then another hash and, an, and another hash and so on. But it's uh, computationally very, very expensive. And it's uh, uh, because of that, like, you know, people can't technically do it or like practically do it. So that is kind of the conclusion of like Bitcoin, or oh, sorry, the uh, blockchain basics. And next I wanna, you know, um, tell you that uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency are not the same thing. You probably know this already. Uh, but uh, as a computer scientist, you should appreciate uh, three key properties of blockchain technologies. Um, so like the web is an application on top of uh, the internet stack, uh, cryptocurrency is an application on top of uh, blockchain, right? So that application is made possible because of these three nice features, uh, cryptographic identities. We briefly discussed that people should have a public and private key pair, right? So that's, you know, uh, someone's cryptographic identity. If you have Bitcoin, you probably have something called a Bitcoin address, which is your public key. And then we need to have a consensus protocol to make sure that you know, uh, these nodes will uh, work together and commit a block to the chain. And then the blockchain is nothing more than a you know, data structure. Uh, what you see here, if you had studied algorithms or data structures, that's a Merkle tree. Um, so again, like, you know, it's a specific kind of a tree uh, that we call a blockchain, right? So with that, uh, I also want to give you some idea of uh, you know what was there before. So the ro the the long road to Bitcoin is actually littered with uh, so many corpses of uh, uh, car digital currencies that failed over the years. Uh, here's a little exercise for you guys. Can you uh, look at this for a few seconds and tell me which you know cryptocurrencies you recognize? So just off. to be clear, these were the cryptocurrencies that were available and flopped before Bitcoin came into Right, payments. yeah. Okay, I didn't know that. I thought that was the question. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, since 1970s, people have been, you know, developing digital cash, not really cryptocurrencies, okay. digital cash uh, schemes, and, like, these are some uh, implementations of, okay. uh, you know, such digital cash so schemes. Based on blockchain no, no. They have different, uh, they have uh, certain properties of uh, Bitcoin and blockchain. Uh, or other, you know, properties of blockchain in them, but not as successful as Bitcoin, obviously. Yeah, I, I recognize PayPal. PayPal, yeah. yeah. So PayPal is, uh, you know, and PayPal, unfortunately, is not a, a decentralized, uh, you know, cryptocurrency, right, as you probably know, but it's a digital cash scheme where people can send money uh, over the internet. Um, and uh, this e-cash thing is the very first one. Uh, it was commercially deployed in 1986 by uh, somebody called David Chaum. Um, but like, it didn't actually take off because otherwise we'd be, we'd be using dig, uh, DigiCash, right? Or eCash. Um, yeah. So some takeaways from like this long road to Bitcoin um, success is that, uh, you know, this is the value of uh, Bitcoin since 2007-ish. So back in 2008, 2009, I went to MIT for grad school. So uh, I remember like in 2008, uh, I, uh, one of my friends like, you know, called me to say that, hey, you know, there's this meetup for this new uh, cryptocurrency thing. At the time, I didn't have any money, <laughs> so I didn't want to invest anything. But at the same time, the, the value of uh, Bitcoin was, you know, going at like, you know, $5, like, you know, something like that. But even that, like, I didn't want to put because, <laughs> You know, as a grad student, like, you know, <laughs> it could be my, you know, um, coffee, right? Um, but yeah, so uh, it took a while for it to hit the high that we see today. Uh, and I think at some point it hit like, you know, 20,000. Right now it's trading at like, you know, 10,000, you know, uh, dollars. Those days, you won't believe, like, you know, I used to get these uh, pieces of papers uh, with like, you know, the public and private key pairs. 
you know, that was virtually, you know, zero <laughs> at the time. And in fact, I had lost multiple of those, you know, pieces of paper. Um, yeah, so, three yeah, three, uh, but I lost it. That, that's okay. the thing. Like, you know, when I moved from, like, you know, when I graduated from my I didn't, you know, care about those things. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, lessons learned. Like, you know, if somebody tells or gives free money, like, you know, <laughs> pieces of paper, you know, keep, keep that, yeah, <laughs> keep that with you. So anyway, I want you to appreciate, uh, you know, lessons uh, from Bitcoin success. So I, I mentioned that researchers have been uh, working on this digital cash for a long time. And uh, there were so many bottlenecks or like, you know, uh, something didn't add up. Maybe the technology worked fine, but people weren't adopting it, right? Uh, but, you know, uh, just because it failed, failed for, you know, 20 years, uh, doesn't mean that there's a system out there that will work. And I, I guess it's the, the same thing for AI research, right? When I was in uh, undergraduate, uh, doing my undergraduate studies and even in grad school, AI wasn't really a big thing. But now, like with the advances of deep learning, AI came out of the digital or like AI winter. And now everybody's talking about AI. Everybody's doing AI, right? So, um, so yeah, so you shouldn't give up the, on a problem. And I think Jeffrey Hinton says that because, you know, it's his life's work and, um, yeah, anyway, I digress here, but, uh, and the right compromise. So some, some of the other uh, cryptocurrencies failed because they either wanted complete control over the identity of uh, whoever's transacting with, uh, you know, each other. Uh, Bitcoin had the right compromise. So it's not completely anonymous, right? Um, you have the public key, which looks like a random you know, set of string, strings and numbers. But you know, if you look at the ledger, if you can mine those patterns of uh, transactions, you can sort of guess you know, the profile of that particular user. So you know, I think Bitcoin had the right kind of compromise uh, uh, with useful anonymity. And then success through numbers. So uh, right now, uh, blockchain-based technologies have a massive developer adoption. People are very passionate about developing uh, these things. Um, so success through numbers, which is hard to you know, depend on if you're a researcher, but it's a nice thing to have. Another uh, kind of uh, you know, interesting one is this innovative incentive engineering. So you probably have heard about mining Bitcoin, right? So that's the incentive for doing hard work that no one probably wants to do if you know, uh, there's no good incentive. So uh, Bitcoin actually figured out the economic incentive for uh, you know, letting somebody do the work that no one wants to do. So that's again a nice uh, you know, takeaway from uh, Bitcoin success. All right, so no more questions? No? I have a few yeah. questions. Yeah. So uh, those uh, currencies, mm -hmm. and digital platforms, typically relied on putting our money in the system and they right. do, do the transaction or something or send it to somewhere else. Right, but right. Here it's kind of different because you mine it, right? So right. you're not really putting that much money, but you're, right. you're investing in maybe some gear and then you get rewarded. Right. So could you explain? Uh, did that have anything to do with So that money actually came uh, with this uh, incentive uh, engineering, right? Okay. So even in, uh, let's say, uh, a digital cash scheme like uh, eCash, right? Mm -hmm. So there you have the same problems as Bitcoin. Now, when you send, uh, let's say, a document to somebody, right? You can keep another copy and send it to somebody else. So because these are digital assets, you can like, you know, Bitcoin or like any kind of, uh, you know, cash thing, uh, digital cash uh, token, you can, if you want, you can copy it, right? So all of the thing, all of the, you know, digital cash uh, schemes I uh, showed above, uh, showed in, you know, two sides uh, before, they had this double spending problem, like right? they were trying to address like, you know, how do you prevent somebody from uh, not spending, uh, yeah, the same same uh, money, right? So, uh, you know, that was, uh, you know, kind of solved effectively in, uh, you know, Bitcoin. And those guys also solved those, you know, problems. But I think with Bitcoin, like you were saying, like, you know, um, it's totally decentralized because they, um, they also wanted to have this cyber, like, there's this notion called cyber funks. So they are anarchists, like you know, they don't want like you know have the central authority 
like a uh, you know central ba bank governing the rates of you know so there were these aspects also uh, in uh, bitcoin development uh, but uh, you're right this thing was not there in most of the other you know digital cash schemes but they all um, tried to address the same problem double spending problem record keeping right um, so those things were still there okay So talking about decentralized applications, so uh, when Bitcoin became a success, people wanted to know how they can extend the Bitcoin uh, blockchain. Um, you know, how can we write like interesting applications? How can we play games on the Bitcoin uh, blockchain? So those things are not possible by design. Uh, there were these things called scripts that you can do, you can use to do, you know, very simple kind of computations on, you know, whatever transactions that are happening. Uh, but people wanted more, right? Uh, so then somebody called Vitalik Buterin, he created uh, a platform called Ethereum. How many guys have heard about Ethereum? Yeah, so Ethereum is the very first uh, blockchain system that allowed developers to uh, write uh, programs using these things called smart contracts. So you can think of this like, you know, the distributed ledger or the blockchain is the data structure and smart contract provides the code. Uh, the programming, you know, platform to, you know, achieve uh, interesting things, right? Um, so there are multiple application domains. Um, so cryptocurrencies being the most famous one. Uh, even, you know, traditional fiat currency uh, banking, you know, systems, they use blockchain to, you know, figure out, you know, where things are flowing. Uh, supply chain, Walmart, for example, they are uh, using uh, this very successfully. Uh, for tracking provenance of, uh, you know, uh, grocery items. So if they have to recall, you know, let us because uh, of E. coli, you know, not infection, E. coli contamination, they can go to, you know, uh, the specific aisle and, you know, pull that out and not have to, uh, you know, throw away all of their produce. And in healthcare, uh, there are multiple applications, so doctors can, uh, you know, share their patients information for referrals and things of that nature uh, and you know patients can uh, explicitly give permission via smart contracts saying that hey I want my uh, medical records to be used for medical purposes only not for commercial purposes uh, uh, you know things of that nature uh, voting um, you know uh, whether this person voted twice or not like you know that can be uh, avoided you know Avoiding uh, somebody voting twice is possible through a blockchain based uh, voting uh, smart application. Um, and property records, like, you know, I think uh, uh, Jose, right? Uh, yeah, when you talked with me, like, you know, you know, that's another, you know, big area. And uh, even things like, you know, um, self organizing entities. Right now, like, you know, uh, today from the airport, I took an Uber to come here. Uh, but still, like, you know, you have the central authority, you know, Uber, the company that manages, uh, you know, or coordinators, coordinates all these, you know, rides. But what if, like, you know, um, all these different drivers, you know, self-organize and, you know, have a smart contract that governs who gets the car at what time. So those kind of things are possible with smart uh, contract-based applications. How are we doing on time? Okay. Okay, so to summarize, um, blockchain and smart contracts, uh, it enables trustworthy data sharing between untrusting par parties in tamper-proof manner. And uh, smart contracts allow flexible and expressive logic uh, to govern updates. However, just like the transactions that are committed on the blockchain, once smart contracts are deployed, they cannot be changed, right? So now this is the uh, you know central premise of my you know research work. Uh, our research goal is can we predict, detect, and fix unexpected situations in smart contracts. So you might be wondering what are these unexpected situations? Let me give some examples. Uh, lost keys. So if you have been following this crypto news, you might have heard that uh, this exchange called Quadriga CX. Uh, they lost $145 million worth of uh, 
customer cryptocurrency because the CEO died and he's the only one who knew the password uh, to unlock all these you know, cryptocurrencies. And I think they are still trying to figure out what to do for these uh, custom assets. Uh, the court case is still ongoing in Canada. You know, this company is registered in Canada. And then another funny thing is this UK man, you know, like me, uh, when Bitcoin was not a thing, <laughs> he had mined some coin, and then he had forgotten that he had uh, 7,500 Bitcoins on his hard disk. And he had forgotten and he had thrown it, uh, you know, to his stash. And then when Bitcoin became a thing, he wanted uh, to dig up the landfill <laughs> to recover the, uh, the hard disk. Yeah, so... Yeah, so they've estimated that uh, between 2.78 uh, to 3.79 million uh, Bitcoins are already gone for good. So um, uh, there's only going to be 21 million Bitcoin ever uh, in existence, right? That's how the protocol was defined. So that means, you know, close to, you know, 12 percent of, uh, you know, the Bitcoin already, you know, are not there. And some of, you know, I don't have millions, but like, you know, I have few Bitcoins in this, you know, uh, in this number here. So. It, it's unfortunate. So what's the problem with this? Like now when you uh, forget your um, password to the banking app, right? You can say, forgot my password, or you can call your you know, bank to say, hey, I forgot my password. Uh, give me my uh, you know, account back. In decentralized systems, you can't actually do that because there's no uh, you know, administrator that you can complain, right? Um, so that's the you know, problem uh, with uh, these kind of account uh, uh, recovery, you know, issues. So this is by design. Like we are not saying that this is not how it should be, but as you know, blockchain-based systems becomes mainstream, right? Uh, we want to think about people who are not that tech-savvy. You know, people will lose their, you know, uh, private keys. So how can we actually recover that money? Because, you know, that's uh, that's still there. Even though you lost the key, that doesn't mean the asset is gone, right? Only the access to the asset is gone. Yes. <coughs> So the Bitcoin that have been lost are still in the network or in the yeah. blockchain, right? Right. It's just that there, no one knows how to access. Like right. Have the key. Yeah. So the guy that threw his hard disk away, like if he remembers like a key or something. Yeah, he could recover it. Yeah. Recover yeah, it's in the network. Yeah. Physically no. In like a file or something. No. Okay. Yeah. So what he uh, actually lost was like you know the private uh, so keys which was in, in the hard disk. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question, yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, I think you have some questions for them on the, the related work, right? So here are some related work on this, uh, you know, specific work. Uh, so uh, some people, Lee et al., they worked on a robust uh, identity recovery scheme for Ethereum blockchain platform. So there what they did was uh, uh, you define an emergency contact. Uh, for your account. So if you lose your account, you just say to the you know, um, emergency contact, hey, I lost my account. Uh, please sign a particular transaction so that I'll, uh, you know, I can recover my account, right? Uh, so that required you to think ahead, right? So it's not really unexpected. Like, you know, you kind of expect, like, no, I might uh, really lose my, my, I might lose my account. And um, uh, this work, you know, they work on something called T of N key sharing. So what they do is like they take a big key, they shard it, like you know, they uh, you know uh, uh, break it into like you know, multiple pieces, and then different nodes have that piece. So with that piece alone, you can't really uh, control that account, but uh, with a certain number, that's the T number, you can control the account. Uh, but this is susceptible for n uh, to nerd node churn, meaning like you know some nodes can you know leave the network then. That T number could go down, right? Uh, so there are uh, multiple, you know, attack, uh, you know, uh, attacks on this proposal. So um, let me tell you our idea. So uh, at the surface, it's a very simple idea. Uh, so on the public ledger, you see something like this. So A is actually a long, um, you know, public key, but you have something like this: A sent B thousand coins, some token. So uh, the account owner, in this case A, uh, might know what this is about, right? So they know that they transferred the thousand coins to buy a phone from B. 
and the trade partner B, uh, who will later become the voter, that's why I call uh, trade partner slash voter, uh, will remember that uh, uh, A bought a phone from me, right? But other users, uh, they only have access to that public ledger, so you know they might not know what they really bought. Like you know, maybe it's a camera, right? So the, we are leveraging this information asymmetry between the trade partners um, and other users in providing a solution for this problem. So yeah, so like I was saying, you know, uh, there's an asymmetry between what everybody knows. So looking at the public ledger, uh, they'll know the transaction amount and who the partners, uh, the trade partners were. Uh, but uh, the trade partners know some other things, like you know, uh, the goods that was the that that were transacted, the method of delivery, right? So what we do is uh, we first ask the person who lost the account to submit a recovery proposal. Uh, the recovery proposal has two things. It has something called a statement saying like, you know, what really happened, and then an encrypted proof. So this encrypted proof, um, you know, is uh, directed at their trade partners. So we know the trade partner's public key. We know the specific information that uh, only your trade partner will know. Uh, so we encrypt that, and we have this set up. And, uh, you know, we, use a spam filter to filter out any um, you know, bad requests. And then we have this voting process where we send the proof to uh, the, uh, the trade partners to say that, is this a legitimate account recovery request? And uh, if you know, they all say yes, uh, then the account is recovered. So we have some safeguards uh, because again, like this is also susceptible uh, to many different attacks. Um, so there can be denial of service attacks where people you know, keep sending you know, uh, spurious requests. So that's why we have the spam filter. So if we, if, you know, uh, the spam filter is not like, you know, obviously it doesn't perform 100% all the time. Um, but you know, we use that to prevent uh, spurious requests. And then the voting uh, is there. And then we also have another thing called uh, owner vetoing. So once uh, you know, we are trying to recover an account. The owner will also get a notification saying that somebody is trying to recover, you know, this account. It's similar to, you know, you know, when you log in from a <laughs> different computer, you, you, you know, Gmail says, you know, hey, did you log in? <laughs> is this you? So it's something like that. So all these things are there to prevent uh, any malicious requests uh, on this pr particular proposal. Okay. So to summarize this, uh, you know, a proposal what we have is we have the old account. We have uh, the old account user uh, has to create a new account to uh, do this you know, recovery process. Um, and uh, uh, the recovery will actually call uh, a function on the smart contract. And the smart contract will notify the original owner and will uh, send that uh, proof to uh, the, uh, the voters or the trade partners. And then they'll vote and then um, you know, if the old user is alive and well, they'll, you know, they can do the veto recovery. Um, and then, um, yeah, this part I forgot to mention. So transfer money from old account to new account, uh, that happens. But, you know, when the new account is created, the user, old user has to put some money as rewards to the voters. Remember, this all works on some incentive, right? No one work, wants to work for free. <laughs> so you have to give some reward to the voters, uh, which I'll illustrate in a you know uh, scenario next. So here, like you know, we actually implemented this uh, using something called Hyperledger uh, Composer. So here we have a bunch of user profiles. So we have uh, this is the name. So uh, Alice has thousand coins, Bob thousand, uh, Chloe thousand, right? So we have a bunch of uh, users up to user five, and then user six is a new user. That name is also Alice. So that's this user who had forgotten their, you know, key. Um, so as you can see here, uh, the recovery initiator they have to put uh, whatever amount that they want to give away uh, as uh, incentive to their voter. So you know, Alice thinks, okay, with 200, I can probably recover my account. <laughs> um, so that's uh, you know, initial setup. Yeah. So basically, uh, 
all of these voters are people who have had transactions with Alice before? Right. Different transactions and then they all verify like, okay, right. you bought a phone from me, you bought a house yeah. from me or whatever. Right. So Alice has to say, okay, in, in uh, her uh, proof, um, she has to take, like, let's say for, with Bob, if uh, she bought a phone from Bob, uh, she has to prepare a proof for Bob saying that I bought uh, a phone, this color, like blah, 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 from you. Uh, please vote uh, to recover my account. So only Bob will be able to see that, nobody else. So uh, Bob uh, decrypts that uh, proof and then votes oh. after seeing that. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah, so uh, when that recovery function of the smart contract is uh, uh, initiated, uh, there's a transaction like this. So yeah, the statement will uh, say something like this. In this case, it actually passed our, uh, the spam filter. Uh, and then uh, the poll is also initiated. Uh, and then there are these vote tokens. So uh, when the voting happens, uh, smart contract takes Alice's 200, the new Alice's 200 coins into the smart contract. And then uh, after the account is recovered, um, the old Alice right, uh, has zero. Uh, new Alice, Alice has uh, uh, more money. Yeah. So what prevents like Alice being able to bribe like all those voters, right. you know, like if she had a lot of money in the account, right? It might take only five hundred bucks, you know, to pass the vote. That's a very good point. Yeah, so it's a threat, uh, you know, in in this particular proposal. So they can collude, right? These people can collude, uh, and you know, um, uh, yeah. That's why we have the veto thing. So if the old Alice is still there. Uh, Old Alice can veto the thing, okay. right? I think, I think it was like these are decentralized, right? So you don't know who gets this. Uh, vote right. Or yeah. Or it's a public key, but like I was saying, it's pseudo anonymous, so you can actually figure oh, so out. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, oh, sorry. Uh, Al Alice, the old Alice, like she'll basically get a notification, but uh, from what I understand. You have to. You can't really pull the blockchain, right? Like you have to depend on some server to do that for you. The smart contract, uh, right? Yeah. It's basically you only can ask for a smart right. contract to do something. Right. You can't You're right. Have it notify you like an email. Yeah. So in that case, we assume that uh, Alice is an active user of the system. Okay. Right. If she's not, then yeah, somebody can actually recover that account. Uh, yeah. In this scenario, these two Alice is the same person, right? The, yeah, the it's supposed to be. To right, but he's asking uh, like attack yeah, vectors attack on attack this. Attack. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so that's uh, that. Actually, concludes uh, these token-based uh, unexpected situations. Now I'll talk briefly about smart contract based uh, unexpected situations. Uh, but let me start with an example. So uh, let's say we have this smart contract governing how my health data is shared between doctors, right? So in my smart contract, I might only give permission to a certain network of doctors. And right now I'm traveling in Chicago. You know, I faint here, right? <laughs> and I was take, I'm taken to the you know, hospital, but uh, my, um, you know, like attending doctor will not have access to my record. Like they'll treat me, but they might have to do unnecessary tests that will incur, you know, extra time uh, and uh, for treatment and you know extra cost for me, right? So uh, we want to like you know figure out how we can uh, essentially break, break glass in case of emergency uh, in smart contracts. So again, some related work, state of the art on this. Uh, this is again like you know people have thought about this problem, uh, and in fact there was this famous uh, attack on Ethereum DAO. Uh, DAO stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. There, what they did was they gave a pool of money, and uh, they wanted people to work, like do some you know tasks to get money, right? So it's like a self-organizing uh, startups essentially. But there was a hack. 
you know somebody exploited uh, you know some very you know small thing and uh, you know they stole a bunch of assets so what they did was like they forked the chain so now if you look at ethereum um, you know um, uh, coin exchanges you'll see ethereum uh, classic and ethereum so ethereum classic is the unforked you know chain ethereum is the forked chain because the developers wanted to correct that error um, so this is very very expensive because you have to fork an entire chain uh, to fix uh, an issue. And then uh, this ogre, like they run this predictive uh, marketing kind of company. Uh, they introduced this notion of kill switches. So you know, uh, if they you know, figure out some kind of vulnerability in the smart contract, they essentially kill the smart contract. Again, this was frowned upon by the cyber funks because it's not truly decentralized, like there's this central uh, centralized notion there. Uh, so again, like you know, that was uh, you know again, uh, people think it's not a you know good solution. Uh, and then the obvious thing is like you know before you deploy the smart contract, test, 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 right? Like you know you do some formal verification, and see that uh, you know you think about everything, uh, you know stuff you learn in software engineering classes, right? Uh, but you know our premise is that like. There can be situations where even regulations might change in the future. Um, because I work with uh, some spectrum uh, company, and their main problem is like they want to expand to other jurisdictions. So, uh, you know, the rules are different, rules change. So, how do you, um, you know, cater to these changing uh, parameters? So. I'll uh, kind of quickly go through this. Like you know, our solution here is like we have a smart contract like this. I won't go into too much detail here, uh, but uh, we analyze the smart contract like the you know formal verification, uh, but without really fixing anything. Uh, we have this uh, uh, you know chain. Like uh, this is kind of a you know very simple example. We have a bunch of assets, so we look at the. Um, the range of values these assets can take. So we pre-populate these assets into the smart contract. And then when some, something unexpected happens, we again you know, request uh, a bunch of uh, peers to vote on that particular situation. And because that new um, change in the asset is encoded in the smart contract, now we are able to change that particular asset. OK? So now, again, this also has a, a, a little bit of a limitation. Uh, the limitation here is that if somebody, you know, pulls you every time, you know, somebody had made a mistake in a smart contract, uh, if they're asking, hey, you know, can you vote for me, uh, vote for this particular unexpected situation, uh, that's not uh, that reasonable, right? So then we thought about um, learning these preferences uh, kind of dynamically, so we injected the learning data into the smart contract itself, and uh, based on their past preferences and past history of voting, we learn these uh, preferences using the Thurston Mosteller process. So there we, uh, you know, represent the unexpected situation by a, f a feature vector, and uh, there are feature vectors for accepting a proposal and rejecting a proposal, and then we iteratively learn uh, this parameter beta for each voter and then we feed that back into the smart contract. So now the smart contract is a little bit smarter because they are able to identify the preference of the user for any kind of voting uh, scenario, right? So any questions so far? Sure. So suppose there are no transactions, you just keep on, so you have 100 bucks. Mm -hmm. I have. I didn't buy anything from anybody. So okay. In case I don't have anybody to ask voting, vote for me. Right. Uh, is there like a situation where that can be addressed? Uh, well, the very first transaction, right? So in blockchain, you know, somebody has to give you that uh, hundred bucks. Okay, it could be like right. Yes. Yeah. So that's also a trade. At least there has to be one. One. Transaction. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, another thing we wanted to do is to, you know, 
utilize external oracles to guide the transaction execution. Uh, so again, like smart contract may be limited in its scope, right? So it might do certain things, but you want to do something extra. So that oracle, uh, which is living off chain, could help guide uh, the execution of the smart contract. So, oracle, sorry. yeah, oracle, oracle. Yeah, I, I'll go through an example. Okay, okay. Uh, but Oracle is, is essentially uh, some domain expertise, right? So uh, a programmer comes in and you know codes up a smart contract. They essentially have some kind of uh, domain expertise. But uh, with the anticipation of external uh, changes, they might create this Oracle, uh, which will guide the smart contract execution in the future. I'll give an example, so maybe it'll be a little bit clearer. So I know that you know this is the start of the semester, right? People are uh, or students are you know selecting courses uh, to take. Uh, just imagine that there is this kind of a smart contract where uh, there's a particular course, and uh, on the first day only seniors can register for that course. Second day, uh, juniors, and so on. Um, an unexpected situation. This is a completely made up <laughs> scenario. A freshman with a very good GPA uh, may get special uh, permission to enroll in a full, already full course, right? Uh, so usually like the professor can make an exception and can invite uh, that uh, student into the course. Uh, but if you are doing this with uh, smart contracts because there's no proper function, it's, it's not possible. So how can we implement this using an external oracle? So uh, the domain expert, uh, you know, the university uh, will probably have this uh, uh, ontology, which is, you know, uh, essentially a bunch of nodes and arrows <laughs> saying that, you know, the student can take a course, uh, can add a course, the course has these, uh, you know, uh, uh, features and so on. We also have rules in the ontology. Um, you know, the rule uh, will initially have only the, uh, the uh, actually, this rule might not be there, but when the professor wants to add a certain uh, student that satisfies a certain criteria, can go and uh, add this particular rule to that ontology. So here, um, this is actually written in Swirl, semantic web rule language uh, format. Uh, it's actually very easy to read this thing. Just think of this as you know conditionals in an if statement. And this is the then, so antecedent and the consequent. Uh, so in our scenario, like you know, we want uh, this particular student to have a good enough GPA, um, and then, uh, yeah. So it's essentially that, like you know, this student has a GPA, uh, and the course has a required GPA, and uh, it should be greater than or equal to this required, uh, you know, grade, right? And then uh, this student's year is, you know, this required year, right? So the professor goes and edits this uh, smart contract, creates a new uh, transaction to uh, commit this particular oracle into the blockchain, and then uh, uh, the student should be able to you know, add that particular course. So when the smart contract executes, uh, it will create this link, you know, saying that the student can now add this course. So that's what happens after you execute. Any questions on this so far? Yeah. It's so much more complicated to add the rule than just to <laughs> administratively override and Right. But uh, yeah. yeah, just uh, imagine this to be a you decentralized course selection system. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the student can now do it all by itself. That's the idea. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Without the student can add the course. Yeah. Yes, without having to go meet people and get the special. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm very new. I might ask very no, no, but these are all you know interesting questions. Um, okay, so this is kind of the overview of uh, my you know uh, research on the scales project. So if you uh, you know uh, if you want to like you know take away one thing, like you know it's this you know <laughs> uh, picture. So we have uh, a smart contract. We tried to characterize unexpected situations uh, from the smart contract. Uh, and then we have a smart contract processing engine that looks at the assets, part participants, and the transactions that are created by the smart contract. And then try to conceptualize how those things might change. Uh, and then we also apply learning to essentially learn preferences of uh, you know, these voters. So one of my collaborators, he's a, uh, 
he's an expert on computational social choice. So that's why we have this uh, you know, group decision making. And it's also actually rel quite relevant for blockchain-based systems because, uh, uh, like I mentioned in one of my previous slides, without the numbers, without you know, people using it, it won't really achieve uh, you know, any results. So uh, the content of this presentation was based on uh, these four papers that were published uh, this year. Um, and if any of you are interested, I can send the papers to you uh, to take a look. Uh, and if you're interested in taking a look at the presentation at your leisure, it's available at this uh, URL. And uh, feel free to email me anytime, and that's my email address. So any further questions that I can answer? Um, so uh, just to see if I am clear on the subject. So your research is basically learning the preferences of the voters uh, as they vote. So do you get the, in, uh, the information uh, like constantly? Mm -hmm. Whenever I vote for something, uh, I update the beta right. for, for my preferences. Yeah. So then at some point, uh, you're going to have enough information to know, like, right. with a certain amount of... Uh, right. However, we are aware that, you know, it won't work for all possible cases. In a, you know, course selection thing, yes, it might work, because imagine a course that has capacity 100, but, you know, fi uh, 50 more students are interested in uh, adding that course. So then if you have to vote for, you know, this extra 50, that seems like, a, you know, um, too much. So if you can learn, that's good. But in the case of, let's say, you know, uh, these presidential elections, if you had voted for Donald Trump one year, would you vote for him uh, another time, right? So you can't really, you know, learn preferences that way. So um, I had to tell you, like, you know, it's case by case. So s for some smart contracts, it might work. For some, it might not make sense. So, and that's why we have the Oracle, you know, thing. Uh, so that's an external knowledge source that domain experts will uh, create to guide the smart contract. So that's another, you know, solution. Yeah. Um, I, I don't really know that much about the, the blockchain stuff and, and all that, but I, I do know about other systems which are based on production rules, mm -hmm. like um, like SOAR and ACTAR. Are you familiar with them? Uh, so I know ACTAR. Like it's A-K-T-O-R, right? No. No, okay. A no, then I do not know that. It's, a, it's more of a psychological cognitive theory, which is based on the idea of production rules, which are similar to what, did you say it was swirl? Swirl, yeah, semantic web rule. Yeah, yeah so, um, you know, conse uh, antecedents and consequence, essentially like that. Mm -hmm. um, but both of them include this idea, possibility of learning rules like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just wanted to bring up, um, see what you thought about that, like if you had like I was saying, have the professor just, um, you know, override the system or, or ask the, you know, right. administrative uh, staff to override um, for this one case to let that student in, mm -hmm. um, but then give some justification for why it happened. I was wondering, will you, will you right. so the possibility uh, of automatically learning that kind of rule instead of, you know, sort of expecting that? Right, right. So that would... Um, you know, assume that this is a central system. So, uh, if you can, if there's one central authority that can change that particular smart contract, then we might not even need a smart contract in the first place, right? So, that university example, like you know, if it's just one university, it probably won't mo make any sense. But if you think of a consortium of universities that are sharing uh, a course, like maybe like online lectures, right? Uh, so then, you know, if one entity alone cannot make a decision on adding a, a student, uh, then, you know, this kind of thing could be useful. So I, I agree with you. For a, for a single university, a professor can simply override and, like, you know, add the student. Uh, writing the rule is, you know, uh, way too much. <laughs> well, right, but, but, uh, but I'm thinking about the possibility of having, you know, something, some intelligence in the system that could learn, right. oh, this, is, this happened. Yeah. Where whatever kind of um, contracts that I already have were not sufficient to deal with this, right. apparently not sufficient. Yeah, yeah, that would be a very nice thing to have. So 
uh, with preference learning, we are trying to get at that, but from a voting side of thing, right? Because it's very easy to, you know, figure that out. I have to admit. But uh, you know, looking at rules, if you don't especially have the data to back, uh, you know, how things might behave in the future, it's kind of hard to make that determination. Uh, but yeah, with enough data, I, I think you know what you're proposing is certainly doable. So these smart contracts are basically for not necessarily uh, like for financial transactions, right? So these it are could like be. It could be, yeah. Okay. So it could um, also be for things like games. So um, I now have a student who's working on this, you know, Ponzi scheme-like game, mm -hmm. where you know you put uh, it's called FOMO 3D. Okay. So uh, there's some goal, right? You, if you put money, like you know, your pointer moves a little bit, right? So if you are the last one to reach that uh, you know goal you get like you know a big payout like in you know, 20 million dollars <laughs> right huh I mean, in digital currency uh, and uh, right value. yeah but like you can exchange that for real money real oh, fiat okay. money yeah and there are things like you know crypto kitties right so it's like you know somebody created this very basic cat you know the internet is full of cats cats right so <laughs> so you can clone uh, this crypto kitty and you can add things like you can change the color and you can trade those kitties. So that's called another game. So all those things are possible with uh, smart contracts. So it's not just for money transfer. You can so you know, trade any digital. Incorporated, the smart contracts have already been incorporated in these games that you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. OK, yeah. that's cool. So yeah. any new things that you learned from like how these smart contracts would behave in like a larger context? It's yet to be seen. So okay. there are these, um, I don't know if you follow, there are these multiple companies that uh, launch ICOs, initial coin offerings, yeah. like how you know companies do IPOs. Uh, so what they do is like, you know, they say, okay, my cryptocurrency, uh, let's say this crypto kitty thing. So it, uh, you are able to like, you know, trade this new kitty. So because of that, like, you know, buy my, you know, <laughs> tokens. Um, so there are multiple proposals like that. So. You know, if you can kind of dream, <laughs> it, you can implement that in um, you know uh, smart contracts well, kind of thing. Easy. Yeah, okay, cool. yeah. But how successful all these different things will be, I do not know. Okay. So you know, when uh, the Bitcoin price was increasing, people were asking like, you know, why is this increasing? Like, you know, I don't know. Like, you know, why do you value money? Like, you know, why do you value dollar? Right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's the same thing. So as a computer scientist, it's kind of hard for me to like you know, fathom like, you know, what will happen and like, you know, how, um, uh, it's really, you know, good research questions, but uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Any more questions? <coughs> All good? All right, then let's thank uh, <laughs> Professor Sanjana. <laughs> for more questions, you feel free to reach out to her. And if you want to, yeah, yes, take the I'll, uh, slide. Anyway, uh, Professor Sanjana will send the slides and I will upload on D2L uh, and, uh, and her email as well. All right, thank you all. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Yeah.